Okay, I forgot. Here's another increment. And it's related. In order for you to tie that future to your today, that's basically what I've been doing increments on last, what, four or five times. One of the things that will end up being a motive, like I said before, is do it for the doctrine. The measure of your worth is the doctrine God's putting in you. And as you grow spiritually, you'll come to appreciate just how important that is because you'll come to see how you're better able to think than those around you. It's very disturbing to find this out. Because learning God and looking at God and all the rest of it, you lose the need to think well of yourself. And you almost get into a sort of anti-self mode where anything that even smacks of something good about you, you want to put it down. You want to do that. You develop a change in preference. You prefer to look up to God, so you end up preferring to look up to everybody else. You end up, you know, enjoying living for God, so you end up enjoying living for everybody else. See, it's a paradigm. If you're living for Him, and you're looking up to Him, as my pastor liked to put it, there's an overflow. This is how it really works in the spiritual life. Okay, everybody's always saying, be nice, be nice, be nice to people. They're, they're just looking at the, they're aping the outers. That's not what, that's not how this actually works. How it works is you develop an inner. Where life, the enjoyment and meaning of life to you becomes him. And there's so much happiness in that. Because you're now you don't have to waste time on how good you are. Because, hi, you've got the next five minutes. Do you want to think about how good you are? Or do you want to think about how good he is? Duh, no contest, how good he is. See, this is a test that Adam didn't pass in the garden. But you don't think about it in terms of a test. All you think about is, oh, oh, this is about God. This is about God. This, and you just, you just want it because of that. And then there's an overflow to people and things in life. And you almost get kind of Pollyanna about it. You'll forget that life is crude and rude and stupid. Because you're ennobled by looking at him. And, you know, seeing through his eyes means that there's this higher value and meaning on everything about what he's doing with it. So you start living on that value and you start, as it were, not looking at the thing for what it really is of itself. See, the integration with God provokes a kind of disintegration with this world and at the end of your spiritual life you got to integrate both you start you know and and everybody will say you know don't be worldly don't be worldly yeah if you're busy looking at God you're really not worldly for the first time all these people telling you don't be worldly their idea of worldliness is drinking and dancing and cavorting with the people who do They have no idea what worldly is. They're more worldly than the worldly. Non-worldly means you're busy looking at God. And the more you learn about Bible, the more interesting his whole thought pattern is to you. And you just want him in your life. You know, should I eat Rice Krispies or eggs for breakfast, Dad? Just because you can ask him. Just because you know he'll have an opinion. It's more fun. It's more enjoyable, it's higher, it's better, it's everything nice. It's like having a billion dollars. Except it's better than having a billion dollars. With a billion dollars, the problem is you have all these people around you. With God, you can just be alone. You get the advantage of the money without having the money. Because having the money is a big pain in the neck. 
You have to have it for certain things, but boy, oh boy, it's nice when you don't. Best things in life are free, and that's always been true, and it still is. But anyway, the, the thing is, is that you have to start thinking of yourself the way Christ did. And that's really the, the point of this audio. Because I forgot to cover it. The whole purpose of being alive after you're saved is, first of all, to train in this thing. But right alongside it, and you could argue that it, it's the other side of a first, because they're like two sides of a coin. What was it like for Christ to be here? He wakes up in the morning. I'm the Messiah. Second Corinthians 5, 18 in particular has a real good verse on that where it's talking about just his last name. His last name is his office. His real name is Jesus Ben Yosef. But his official name is Jesus the Anointed One. Christ means Anointed One. He roots Hamashiach. Okay? So Paul just uses the word Christ and leaves out the word Jesus to focus on his office. That tells you how he thought of himself. And of course then that's um, in the same passage which ends with you know, him dying on the cross as a substitute for our sins so we could become the righteousness of God in him. The purpose of his dying was an exchange of his righteousness. To get his righteousness in exchange for our sins. So every morning he wakes up. The quintessential spiritual athlete. Every morning he wakes up. I'm the Messiah. Now think about this. And if you know any athletes it will help to talk to them. When you're an athlete, you spend most of your day training. The thing you do that's your professional sport, you really don't do that often. What you do the most of, five, six, seven, eight hours a day, is you train, you train, you train, you train, you do the same movements over and over and over and over and over and over and over. You could do them in your sleep, and you're supposed to be able to do them in your sleep. They have to become instinctive. My pastor's talked about this with respect to doctrine, too. Doctrinal instincts. You repeat, 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 repeat. Your body is like a dead battery. It holds a charge for a very short time. So you have to keep repeating the action for the body to get trained and remember. You can't just absorb it once. And especially that's true with doctrine. Over and over and over and over and over. There were certain key doctrines that my pastor repeated. Let's see, we went to class seven hours a week. Seven, six days a week, seven hours a week. On Sunday we went twice. And there were 70-minute classes each, so it was, you know, an hour and 40 minutes on Sunday. And there are certain doctrines he would repeat every single class. We got so sick of him. I remember there was one in particular that he called Operation Z. I was so sick of him doing it day in and day out that I, I quit for three weeks. And when I came back three weeks later, he was still saying the same thing. And I thought, okay, I'll just stick it out. A lot of other people did the same thing. He was right. We were wrong. If you don't do that repetition, any athlete will tell you. If you don't do that repetition, you're going to lose the ability to do the action. And here the action is thinking. Instinctual, connecting the dots, thinking. This doctrine relates to this doctrine, relates to this doctrine. You need this, you need that, you need the other thing. So that's why I repeat so much. It's kind of hysterical because I hate repeating. But so did my pastor. <laughs> Okay, repeat, repeat, repeat. That's what Christ had to do with his thinking. He'd wake up in the morning. I'm the Messiah. Identifying his role with the doctrine that's in him. Remember, he became the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am. 
the way, the truth, and the life. But he wasn't that way at birth. At birth, he said, a body you prepared for me. So he wasn't anything but newly born. That's in Hebrews 10.5. And he actually spoke it from his deity. So his parents, you know, would have a sort of attestation. Yes, they weren't hallucinating or being sinful to think that their son is actually the son of God. He spoke from his deity that day. The pastor made a big stink about that too. Something in the tenses that tells you that it was at the moment he was born, he said. Okay, now. If that's his office, then he his whole concept of himself. He wakes up in the morning and I am the Messiah. Okay? Now to the stupid... And to the childish, they're going to say, well, that's being arrogant. It's not arrogance if it's true. You're male. You wake up in the morning and you realize you're male. That's not arrogance. You have a billion dollars. You wake up in the morning and you're aware you have a billion dollars. That's not arrogance. See, we've let the childish, disgusting, retarded, apostate Christians rule the idea of what constitutes Christianity way too long. They've been in control of the definition of Christianity for 2,000 years, and they've been lying for 2,000 years, and that's why the rapture hasn't happened until yet, because we've been letting them get away with it. Of course, they had the Bible under lock and key for the better part of that time. But they don't have an under lock and key now. So what's our excuse now? The second 490 years is going to end in 2030 or 2130, depending on how you count it. 2130 or 2100 by Paul's accounting. And, you know, where are we? Okay, so that's the big point. You wake up in the morning, you are royal family of God. Now that ought to give you a kind of paradigm to hang on to. What if you woke up in the morning and you were Queen of England? She does. Every morning she wakes up, Every time she goes to dinner, she can never forget who she is. It's her office. That's not arrogance. That's who she is. That's what she serves. You serve your office. You wake up in the morning if you're a mother, and you're very aware that you're a mother, or a father, or a husband, or a wife, or an employee, okay? If you're a royal family, you are a royal family in training to become the entire, this is such a killer, I hate saying this, you are in training to become the entire thought pattern of your kingdom. He's the way, the truth, and the life. We're supposed to be like him. We're supposed to be copybook. That's what Peter said when he used the phrase, leaving, you, leaving an example. Greek word there is hupogramenoi. Okay? You are to be a chip off the block of Christ. That's what Petros means in Greek. And the vile Catholic somewhere around 200 A.D. invented the word Petrus to mask the fact. Okay? To mask the fact that Petros means little chip. But Petra means bedrock. And Christ uses the word Petra pointing on his own chest when he's talking in Matthew 16, 18. But in 217 AD, they invented for the first time the idea that Peter was in Rome. They took Paul off the list and put Peter on in order to discredit Origen who was talking to the Severan emperors at the time. And that's when the Vulgate came out. And that's when they invented Petrus.
But Petras, in Greek, means little chip. That's you. You're a little chip of Christ. The goal of the Christian life is to integrate the whole of humanity together. First in Him. We all know that on the cross. And then, And to the great ones, He disperses the booty. What's the booty? La rabim, the people. So you're going to get your own kingdom of people. Maybe it's 60 million, maybe it's 10 million, maybe it's 5 million or 200 million. I don't know. I don't know if, if, if I don't know how he's going to parcel it out. What I do know is that they're designed to fit you. This, this, this is the part of this doctrine I hate the most. I hate talking about it. I hate it being true. But it is true and it makes sense. If you're a royal family of God being trained and you mature in Him, you got all the thinking and everybody around you doesn't. You're the hundredfold. You're the sixtyfold. You're the thirtyfold. So they get folded into you just like we got folded into Christ when He paid for our sins. You're their substitute. And they need a substitute because they substituted for the Word of God religiosity or works or some other kind of banana fan of thing. So they don't have the thinking in their heads when they die. But you do. And the only way they're going to get that thinking now that they are dead, since they elected to be as far away from God as possible, is through you. And that pleases Father, and that integrates them to you, and you're integrated to Him, and that's how the integration works. Now it starts down here. It works in real time, right now. My pastor called it blessing by association. I don't know if he taught what I just said. I mean, he taught some of it. We'll have to go through this that stuff. He taught some of it. Because that's from him that I get these ideas. And then I have to go to scripture and search them. It's a paradigm. Everything that happens to Christ is to happen to you. Because he's the ideal person. So that sets up the, like, the structure of things. And therefore, if, it, if that's the structure using the ideal person, then, and they call that, my pastor called that prototype, then everything else is based on that. So it's not, it's not arrogant at all. It's the rule. It's the standard. And you can deviate from it. And you can fail. And you can opt out. And if you do, you'll be somebody else's subject in their kingdom instead of it being your kingdom. And am I going to actually finish the course and end up being king? I don't know. I might just fail and I'll be at the bottom. So, until the fat lady sings, it ain't over. And there's really no time to get all fat-headed. Especially at the last stage of the spiritual life, because it's really a groaner. There's no, there's no way to get fat-headed about this. If anything, it's real easy to undervalue. And that's actually being arrogant. The doctrine in me is huge. If I sit there and say, oh, I'm nobody, I'm a putz. Yeah, I am a putz. Apart from the doctrine, yes. But the doctrine's in me. It's like being rich. It really is. You know, if you're rich, there's you, and then there's your money. And if you didn't have your money, there'd be a whole lot of things that would be different. But you're valuable because of your money, not because of you. Of course, I'm not so sure money's all that valuable, but a lot of people think it is. So a whole lot of people value the rich because they're rich. The minute they don't have the money, those people are going to go somewhere else. 
Well, you're richer than the rich because the money is inside your head. And a whole bunch of people are alive right now because that information is inside your head. And it's being built so that all the heads that God's going to give you as your booty can get what's in your head in their heads. That's the integration plan. This is really the, you know, the whole story. So now, like an athlete, you wake up in the morning. I'm in training to be king over a whole bunch of people. So I've got to have what? Every thought brought into captivity to Christ. Meaning every thought is associated with him. Every thought is trained and practiced in associating with doctrine, whether I go to sleep or whether I get up in the morning. Just like Deuteronomy enjoined upon the Jews. But the Jews missed it. This is the absolute tragedy of tragedies in my mind. The Jews missed it. Moses predicted the exact year he was supposed to be born. He was supposed to be born on a schedule based on when Abraham matured. And he tracked it in the meter when he wrote. How do you think I know the meter? Because it's in the Bible. How do you think I know Moses did that? Because you can just count the freaking syllables and know. How old do you have to be before you learn how to do a syllable? Let's see. I think I learned English syllables when I was five years old. How to parse an English syllable. Definitely in first grade you learn that. Okay, so a Hebrew kid learns when he's five or six years old. And he starts going to shul when he's seven. So what's so hard that the Jews don't understand how to parse the syllables so they can see this beautiful meter that Moses did in Genesis and Psalm 90 because he wrote both books in the same year when he was 119 years old. Which he tells you in the meter. And the meter sets the tone for the words. The meter and the words interact to show you more punch in other words, the words are what they are, and then the meter is what it is, and the meter always relates to some segment of time that you're supposed to know because, you know, you're Jewish, you're supposed to know your history, all right? And it, it relates to the time, and then you're getting the punch of the time mixed with the words, you know, because like Jacob lived before Moses. So you've got all that history, and Moses is recapping that history while he writes Genesis 1, while he writes Psalm 90. So how is it that the Jews don't know Jesus is the Christ? He's a Jew! And they say, well, no, no, we don't want to be like the Christians. Honey, the first Christians were Jews. Jesus is a Jew. And most of the so-called Goy Christians today, they're anti-Christ. They don't even understand. It's the most heartbreaking thing that of all the people to miss this. To miss the fact that Jesus is their vindication. Jesus vindicates the Jews. His very existence, everything he did, the whole thing vindicates all of the Torah. All of it. And the Jews don't know that. They're so deaf, dumb, and blind that they think it's a Christian thing, a goy Christian invention. No, it's Moses who wrote it. Moses and the patriarchs, Moses and the and the you know the 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 prophets. Okay, all the Old Testament is a testimony to Jesus as the Christ, predicting exactly to the day when he would be born, exactly to the day when he would die. But it's in the meter. Why? Because it's for the Jews. So it's in Hebrew meter. And then the Jews who translated it in Greek, it's not in there because, you know, the Greek syllables aren't the same. 
The same word in Greek has a different syllable count. So it's not metered in the Greek of the Old Testament. It is metered in the Greek of the New. That's how you know which were the original languages that the original authors really penned. By the meter. It's a just brilliant device. And th the New Testament writers, the first New Testament person to do it was Mary. Linking it up with Daniel. And I did the videos on that. The Jews are vindicated by Christ and the Jews won't believe in Christ. And the whole New Testament uses the same meter style, but in Greek, Mary being the first. And they all key off Mary. All their meters key off hers. I've done the videos on that. It'll take several years to go through them because it took me five years to, to you know, write it up. But the, the Jews... This is, what, this is why I identify so much with Paul when he writes Romans 9 through 11. I could kill myself. I could kill myself that the Jews don't understand. Why don't they understand? Jesus is the Messiah. Here's, you, you couldn't ask for more proof. The exact day of his birth and death were predicted. And there was a schedule, but it had to change because David, the, the temple didn't start at the right time and his own birth and death was going to be key to the temple. So, you know, God changed the, the, the year. That's why 1 Kings 6, 1 is there. It's to explain it because David would have been 80 years old when temple construction began. He should have been, he died at 77, which even Josephus didn't know. Because they screwed up their calendar around the time of Josephus. The, the Sider Alam Rabbah, the Jewish calendar today, totally screwed up. You should just throw it out. Everything about it is wrong. <laughs> they were vindicated. 1 King 6 1 says, Hi, we're going to have to change this birth year up three and a half years. Because Solomon started temple building in time for the 490 deadline, but three and a half years later than should have been. Okay, because David's crowning and all the rest of it was based on Abraham's dates. Christ was supposed to be born based on David's dates, but if David's dates are off kilter, then Christ's dates have to be adjusted accordingly. So his birthday would end up being 4103 from Adam rather than 4106 from Adam. So he ends up having to be born three and a half years earlier. And then in Haggai 2, it tells you what day. Hanukkah. Only it wasn't called Hanukkah then. That would be very meaningful. It's Jewish. He's Jewish. He's born on a Jewish holiday. The first day of Hanukkah. He dies on a Jewish holiday. What well, should have been Passover, but, you know, the Jews didn't you know, call it that year. Which is the joke that, that John is telling in John 19. Now, why am I going through this seeming digression? That same stuff is true for you. Your birth, your death are foreknown to the day. There is an agenda for you to complete between today and the day you die. There is a training for you to complete today in thinking. Because a billion years from now, your kingdom is supposed to be living on it. You don't know what that is. So what do you do? Dad, what should I be thinking? But now you've got a real palpable reason. Okay? An integrated why in your day. You are royal family of God. God is training you to be a king. Male or female right now doesn't matter. He's training you to be a king. In the training agenda for you to be a king at some undefined point in the future, what do you need to learn today? What do you need to practice today? Whatever stuff happens in your life today, up, down, right, wrong, good, bad, nice, not nice, it's all designed for some kind of training purpose that relates to your kingship today. What is it? You're not going to know. 
So what you want to do is is just keep on using one jaw and one eye like breathing. Keep on learning and living on Bible, using it on everything you got. Are you, you know, painting at an easel? Well, use Bible doctrine when you paint. Are you washing your car? Use Bible doctrine when you wash your car. If you don't know how, you say to God, Okay, what should I be thinking, Dad? Matthew 4, 4, always occurring. That pleases him, whether or not you are training to be king. So you know it's good. But because you're training to be king, he's building your soul structure in a way you can't see, touch, taste, or feel. That relates to that future, because those people are going to need what's inside your head. And I don't know about you, but what really is thrilling for me is that I have always wanted people to know him. That's my biggest desire. The thing that gets me going. I want them to know him. It's a lot of my motive by making these audios. I want people to see him. It's unfit. Oh, I'm going to start crying. Well, it's just too bad. I get to see him. I know him really well. And it seems totally unfair that I get this great gift and others don't have it. I hate that. I am a personal liberal and a political conservative. To me, liberalism belongs personal. Your personal decision. Anything political has to be, as you know, apart from, has to be conservative. Because you, once you start touching other people's money, you damn well better be conservative because you're being unfair to them if you're not. But with your own money, yeah, be liberal. Okay, it's the reverse of the typical definition of liberal. But anyway... So I can't take it that I am so rich in knowing him and others are so poor. I, it hurts. It, you, it's like stabbing me every day. So one of the motives for getting up in the morning is, okay, you're building my soul now. I've got all this wealth accumulating inside me now so that I can spend it on them when I'm dead. That's a pretty powerful, integrated moment that's very palpable today. I mean, because you know what you're doing. If you're if you're making money to save up for something later, that's 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 got that's tangible. That's tangible. You're studying now to 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 use it later. You're you're saving now to spend it later. You're doing now to relax later. We all know that. Crown before cross? No. Cross before crown? Yes. Cross before crown is essentially... (laughs) (sighs) Okay, well now you can put your whole spiritual life in that same analogy. You're training for a life that you don't yet see. What kind of life is that you're going to have? Kingship. What does that mean? That you're the repository of all the thought and knowledge of him for your kingdom. Because they ain't going to have it. They might be popes in your kingdom. They might be, you know, Bible scholars. And yeah, they know and can spout off a lot of scripture. But they never learned it. You can know a lot of things and yet never learn them. And it will be a real joy to your kingdom in that future eternal state that you really did learn it. And now all those people who memorized and know scripture backwards but never learned it, it'll finally begin to gel for them. And they're going to be so happy. And you're going to be so happy because now your life is just one great big walking mini Christ. And they're going to be hanging on your every word because that will teach them something about him. But they see you, not him. Because he's around making his circuit. You know, going all around heaven. He's in one city or one town or one state or one kingdom on X number of days or X number of months. Then he goes to the next one. Then he goes to the next one. Then he goes to the next one. That's why he needs that 144,000 honorage. 
Okay, because just think of all the contacts and correspondence and everything. And maybe the correspondence is all thought telepathy or something. I don't know. You might do it the low, slow, low technology way. I'm not sure. Because each has a different meaning. All right. Whatever it is that they that he does, he's going to do it based on meaning. The richness of the meaning and probably both. Okay, so when's the next time he's going to come to your kingdom? Could be a thousand years from now. So they got to see you. You're his representative to them. You're how they integrate to him. So you integrate to you now... I'm royal family of God. When you get up in the morning, I'm really royal family of God. Whatever I have on the outside is training to make me learn to be good, you know, make me royal family of God. And all my training is to make me a king. David was a shepherd and he became a king. You're whatever you are, high, low, in the world size, who cares? Whatever it is you got, good, bad, high, low, up, down, rich, poor, sick, well, that's all training material. So what does God want you to do with that? That's who you are. That's really who you are. That's how you integrate to the future. That's how you integrate to yourself. Peace out.